Good morning. I'm coming to you. It feels later than ever today. And um, that's because it's kind of been a hectic morning. So a uh, little short story for you just to know what's going on over here at the Schumpeld Hacienda. Um, we put our house on the market yesterday. Um, it is going up online and people can start seeing it today and we have three showings. Surprise, surprise, very quickly. So we're racing around, getting everything clean, making sure everything's just right. Uh, you know how that goes. Um, that's why my voice is so echoey. My voice is echoing because all of the things that we used to keep in the house are gone. It's kind of a big empty house right now. It, you know, nice and clean. It looks amazing. And that's all because of Mathia. So um, the hard work that she did and more than anything else, the vision that she had for what we needed to do to make this house look nice to sell it. So whatever happens, that's been really cool. And um, house looks better. And I think even in every part of it uh, is be much better than when we bought it. So we're excited to be passing it on to another family in that light. So you can pray for that. Pray for the right family to get this house and, um, of course, at the right price for them and for us. So God's got all that under control and we appreciate your prayers. Now, let's get to our text. Today, we're taking a look at the last part of Luke chapter 11. Now, remember the first part was a really big deal. Here we have Jesus coming into the city of Bethany because a friend of his has died four days earlier and Jesus brings him back to life. Now, this is the penultimate sign in the book of John. I say penultimate because there's one more sign coming and that one's the big, big, big one. So this one though is really a big deal. And of course, he's got noticed a few things to note about it as we start in today's text. He's got a crowd of people around him. It's not done in secret at all. It's, um, this man has been dead for four days. So not just a little bit dead. We're talking dead, lying in the tomb, wrapped in cloth. He's dead, 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 with a big capital D at the end. And now we find um, Jesus has called him out, and the man's unbound, and Lazarus is let go. And so there's this beautiful moment where we see the power of God over death and life, revealed in a way that we have not seen it before in Scripture. And so there's this moment of pause and a moment that should really take us back to Ezekiel and to that uh, line where Ezekiel is supposed to speak to the bones in the valley. And, you know, them bones, them bones, them dry bones, them bones, them bones, them dry bones, that one. Now hear the word of the Lord. And that's, of course, about the power of the word of God to invigorate our hearts and our lives, to to take that which is dead within us and bring it to life when we pay attention to God's word. Jesus is the word in flesh. John's made that very clear. And so it should be no shock to us that the word of God in flesh can bring the dead back to life. That's the whole point of this text. But now we get to the sad part. So yeah, there is a sad part in this chapter. It's not all jubilee and rejoicing and um, resurrection tales. Beginning in chapter verse 45. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and seen what he did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. Notice that specific use of that word. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Do you not understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish? He did not say this of one of his own accord, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also to, to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from here there to the region near the wilderness to a town called Ephraim, where he stayed with the disciples. 
and we're going to jump forward and read to the end of the chapter. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before Passover to purify themselves. They went looking for Jesus and saying one to another as they stood in the temple, What do you think? That he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he should let them know so they might arrest him. And that's our short text for today. We'll definitely get to some bigger ones soon. But here's the text and the weight of it as we lean into it and think about it. Um, he literally raised somebody from the dead. And there were people, even people there, who still went back to the Pharisees and the chief priests and said, hey, I'm not sure about this guy. And this is judging them lightly. And, you know, hey, I'm not so sure about this guy. What do you think? Now, the other way that we could look at it is they went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees to kind of gossip and say, look at what he did. We don't know if this was on a Sunday, but it certainly it would have said if it was on a Sunday, I think. So all that to say, we see this, this destructive pattern of unbelief. And it's a really broken thing. And it's so easy for us as readers to read this and say, oh, that's them. This is us. We know better. Um, sure we do. Now, I'm not just talking about unbelief. I want you to notice the pattern of thought that's behind it. And that pattern of thought is one that we have become more exposed to than ever before. And it's a very tribalistic way of thinking. It's us or them. It becomes ingrained. Um, there, there's this incredible book called, two books actually, Tribes, and there's another one called The uh, Power of Persuasion. And, but in The Power of Persuasion, it's just a short little book. And in it, he does this chapter about how people, when, there's, when they believe something and then something, and then it's proven wrong to them, uh, frequently it happens when people make. Um, you know, the examples that he gave is when, like, a prophet will make a, a thing saying, you know what, where the aliens are going to come on such and such a day, or um, Jesus is going to come back on such and such a day. And you think to yourself, when that doesn't happen, surely they're just going to turn and walk away. Um, they're going to recognize the, the error of their ways. But the, he's, the guy in the power of persuasion says that there's a, there's a psychological impetus that makes humans, makes us all want to double down in situations like that. He told the story of this, uh, this cult in Chicago that believed that there were aliens that were going to come on a day back in the 70s. And when the aliens didn't come, there was this, this kind of confusion and fear within the group. This was a firsthand um, story told by a, a psychologist who was actually documenting what was going on in this group. And he, at first there was this confusion and fear on the day that the alien spaceship didn't arrive. Then this group kind of looked at it and doubled down and uh, they came up with another date. Some one of the leaders said, no, it's, we must have got the dates wrong. It must be another date. And then what happened is they became even more boisterous in their proclamation. Everybody in Chicago had been watching them. They had gotten it on the news. So when it didn't happen, everybody went, oh, yeah, surely this is going to be the end of it. But it was by no means the end of it. The groups um, uh, became even more invested in their, in their schema, in the way that they were seeing the world. And that's what we see happen here with these guys as well. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and those who were invested in their way of thinking, it became, they were so invested in that that every time that Jesus' signs became greater, whether it was at first just healing a few, some sick people or turning water into wine or healing a blind man, um, making the lame man to walk, and then he raises somebody from the dead. All of these things were signs that should have triggered in them repentance and uh, made them turn around and review their situation. But instead, they became more and more invested in, their, in the wrong way of thinking. And that happens to us today as well. Um, we can, we're all victim to it. So there's a need for great humility when we walk in each one of these situations, when we come into conflict, whether it be online or be, whether it be with friends or neighbors or points of view um, in, you know, in the world today, it can be over everything, uh, politics, religion, 
uh, what we feel it feed our children, what they watch on TV or whether they watch TV, um, when they're old enough to watch TV. Um, all of these things can become invested perspectives that, uh, that we just lean into. And it takes this humility to say, you know what, maybe I don't know the full story. Um, and so the tragedy of this text, then the reason I'm spending all this time on this, isn't just because I'm feeling like waxing on about it, it's because in this text, that's exactly what they were not willing to do. Their hearts had been hardened to the gospel because, um, uh, what's the word for it? Our hearts are being hardened to the gospel because of the, because of their investment in the, the way things had been, and they didn't want to change them. Um, and we need to ask the same thing of ourselves in our churches especially we just need to humbly be able to say you know what I don't know the full picture I don't know what my neighbor feels why they feel this way what they've heard what they've listened to um, but we need to be lovers of the truth and we need to be humbly searching for the truth and more than anything else, we need to be searching for Jesus and finding him in scripture and keeping him at the very center. Because in a world where we can just be distracted and confused by so many things, Ecclesiastes says there's, there's endless books and there's no end to the learning in them. Um, where there's all of that, the, the thing that keeps central is with simple humility, the beauty of Christ, the love of Christ, and the gospel, that he has died for us and that we are to live for him. And then we humbly do our best to do that, understanding that we're failing at that, and it's only by his grace that we walk uh, at all. So this text invites us into that. That's the whole point, is to know the word, to look to the word, um, and to keep that central. Keep that central to our conversations. Keep that central to our um to what motivates us. May it be the love of Christ for us and for our neighbor. Let's pray. Jesus, we praise you and we thank you that you have come to a broken-hearted, hard-hearted people. And we know it says that if you did not call us in John 6, that we would not have come at all. And yet all that have, you have called, none will forsake your call. So we come to you trusting in you seeing the beauty of Christ, that you have turned our hardened hearts into something tender and ready to receive the seed of the word of God. Lord, help us to keep it near to us, to water it, to, to care for it well, that it might grow. Keep us connected to the vine, that we might flourish and bear fruit. Father, we pray for those that we know and love who are hurting and mourning, for those that are facing challenges and facing um, marital difficulties, even to divorce. We pray, Father, for people in that very difficult situation. May your comfort, your peace, and your healing be with them. We pray, Father, for um, wisdom in difficult times. And we pray, Father, for each of us, that you would give us a measure and a measure of wisdom and a measure of humility, and most of all, a measure of love, so that we would be known, as John says, for our love, for your love, really, in us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, thank you for joining me today. I hope you have a beautiful day. God bless you all. Bye-bye.